Hey, uh, welcome to the review session for CS246 Mining Massive Datasets. Um, today we will cover proof techniques and probability. Um, on Thursday we have another session for linear algebra. Uh, and we already had an, uh, a session last week for Spark. So um, all this material will be up on the class website as well as the lecture videos. So feel free to take notes if you want to, but we will be putting all this up in any case. Okay. Um, so, my name is Jayadev, I'm one of the ETS for the class uh, and I will be handling today's session. Um, so the agenda for today is that we will start with proof techniques, um, just go over some different types of proof techniques that might be helpful, that might help you during the problem sets and so on, uh, and then go over like a re refresher of basic probability. Um, at any point of time, if you have questions, feel free to stop me um, and you can always ask us further questions on Piazza and otherwise or in lecture. Um, so, let's get started. All right, so um, we will start with proof techniques. Okay, so um, in general, um, if you are asked to prove any particular statement, um, any particular generic statement, um, so you can, one thing you can do is uh, showing that it's true for specific cases, but that does not constitute a proof. For instance, if you're asked to show that the square of every odd number is odd, you cannot say that, oh, three is an odd number and the square of three is nine, which is also odd, and therefore all uh, the square of all odd numbers are odd. So that does not constitute a proof. Um, so what you can do is take a generic example, and if you can prove that it is true for all of the generic examples, uh, you can say that it is true. So for instance, uh, we have, let's say, the same statement. Um, also, if you cannot read anything that I write, or if you think it's not big enough, please let me know. Uh, I will try to write neatly to the best of my ability, but it's not always the greatest handwriting at all. Okay, so um, let's start with something simple. Prove that the square of any odd number is odd. Um, so all we can say about the number that we have in question is that it is odd. Uh, we cannot make any further assumptions about it. Um, so one way to start would be um, to say that any odd number is of the form 2k plus 1, where um, k is also another whole number. Um, so if you square this, uh, you get 2k plus 1 the whole squared, which is four k squared plus four k plus one, um, which is equal to which is equal to two times two k two k squared plus two k plus one, um, which is equal to some two m plus one where m is some other whole number since two k squared plus two k is a whole number. Um, so since it, since we have shown that two k plus one the whole squared is uh, of the form two m plus one, which is also odd. Uh, and this is true for any such odd number. So this is a generic odd number. Uh, we have shown that the square of any odd number is odd. So note that we did not assume anything in specific about the odd number here. Um, we just um, treated it as a generic odd number and went ahead. Okay. Um, so that is something simple. Um, so now we will go with some some techniques that people commonly use for proofs. Okay. So. All right, so um, the first thing we will deal with is called proof by contrapositive. Okay. Um, so uh, let me first explain what uh, contrapositive means and then we can go on and see uh, how we would use this while doing proofs. Okay, so if we have a statement saying A implies B is your statement The contrapositive states that a 
okay. So, the contraposative says uh, not B implies not A. For instance, if your statement was um, if it is raining today, then I do not go to class. Clearly, this is not true for all the people assembled in the room here, but uh, suppose that was your original statement. If it is raining today, then I do not go to class. Uh, can someone tell me what the contrapositive would be? If it is not raining, uh, no. So, uh, so, here our A is if it is raining and our statement here is I will not go to class is the B, is the implication when we say if it is raining. So, um, what is the negation of B here? I will go to class if it is not raining, okay. So, uh, that is what we are saying. So, if, if I have gone to class, that means that it is not raining, okay. Uh, so, that is, uh, so the statement, so proving the contrapositive is equal to uh, proving the statement. So, in some cases, it might be simpler to prove the contrapositive and show that the original statement is true, okay. Um, Let us do some sort of uh, example. Um, so, okay, let us do this. Uh, Okay, um, so let us try to prove uh, that if x squared is odd, x is odd, okay. Um, so, one if we wanted to prove this by contrapositive, uh, the contrapositive of this statement would be right, because something that is not odd has to be even. Um, so, the contrapositive of this is if x is even, x square is even, but uh, this is just what we proved, right, in our previous case, um, sorry, we proved odd squared is odd, but we can prove very simply that if some, if x is even, x squared is even by saying uh, let x be of the form 2k, if we square it, we get 4k squared, which is 2 times 2k squared, which is 2m, which is also even, right. So, for any given even number, we know that its square is even. Therefore, uh, we have proved that if x is even, x square is even. And this is the contrapositive of the original statement which says that if x square is odd, x is odd. So, since we have proved the contrapositive, the original statement also holds true, okay. Um, so, this is uh, one thing that you should be clear is um, there is a distinction between the contrapositive and the converse and people often get confused by them. Um, so, the converse of this statement, uh, so not B implies not A is called the contrapositive, whereas B implies A is called the converse. The converse is not always equivalent to the original statement. Um, so, proving the converse does not guarantee anything about the proof of the original, whereas proving the contrapositive guarantees the proof of the origin, okay. Uh, all right. Um, Let us move to the next of our techniques. All right. Um, so, next we will look at proof by contradiction. Um, so, what proof by contradiction means is that you take a statement uh, that you generally say, uh, you know, you, you, are, you are given a statement uh, and you are asked to prove that it is true. So, you start off by assuming that it is not true and then work yourself to a point where you end up with something absurd uh, that cannot hold and say that therefore, your original assumption was not okay. So That is what proof by contradiction is. It is a fairly powerful technique that can be used in some places. Um, so, again let us go through an example. So, what we are going to do, um, what we are going to try to prove is that the square root of 2 is irrational, okay. Um, so, what do we do uh, as a first step, what did we say? We would assume that this is not true. So, what does that mean? Yeah, so we assume 
square root of 2 is rational, okay. Um, what does that mean? What is the meaning of square root of 2 is rational? Yeah. So, you can write square root of 2 is equal to p by q, right. This is the definition of what a rational number is, okay. So, so if this were true, then this is true. Now, if this is true, you can say that 2 is equal to p by q, then you can say, sorry, p squared by q squared, you can say 2 q squared is equal to p squared. So, until here we just follow from here to here to here to here. So, we end up with this. Um, now, we will try to explain why this is impossible. Um, so, we know that p squared is a square number, right. Um, so, it is a perfect square. Um, that means that its number of prime factors is even. Does that make sense or? So, if p squared was, so we have p squared is equal to p times p. So, what are the pa uh, prime factors of p squared? It is basically the prime factors of p repeated twice, right. For instance, if, uh, if p was, uh, p, if p is equal to 6 and p squared is equal to 36, uh, what are the prime factors of p? 2, 3, okay. What are the prime factors of 36? 2, 2, 3, 3, right. So, whatever this is, this just gets repeated twice uh, because this is a perfect square, right. So, that means p squared has an even number of prime factors because it is a perfect square. Q squared also has an even number of perfect square, uh, prime factors because it is also a perfect square. But 2 Q squared therefore has an odd number of prime factors, right, because we are just adding that extra 2 over there to something that has an even number of prime factors. So, right now we have the left hand side which has an odd number of prime factors and the right hand side which has an even number of prime factors and this is clearly impossible. So, all this arose because of our initial assumption that square root of 2 was rational. Uh, clearly, that is not possible. Therefore, our assumption was wrong. Therefore, square root of 2 is irrational, okay. So, that is an example of uh, proof by contradiction. Um, it is a fairly powerful technique that you can use. Um, many times when you are asked to prove a statement, it might be a good way to just think about saying, uh, okay, let us just assume that it is not true and see if we can come to some result that makes no sense. Um, and if that is the case, you know that your original statement was true, right. Um, cool. So, let us do a few more. All right. So, now we will do All right. Um, so, sometimes it is, um, sometimes you have a few cases that your problem naturally breaks down into. So, proving it for each of these cases uh, would mean that you prove it for the whole, pro, uh, whole set of possible examples. Um, this might sound slightly vague, but let me just explain uh, with an example. Okay. So, Um, let n be an integer um, let n not be divisible by three then n squared is equal to 3k plus 1 for some k. So, n squared is always of the form 3k plus 1 for some other integer k, 
okay. So, we are going to show this uh, by writing out all the possible cases and proving it for each of those cases and therefore showing that it is true across the board, okay. So, um, to start off if n is an integer and you know you are concerned about it being divisible by 3 and so on, uh, what are the different forms it can take? Plus one, three k plus two. Okay. Uh, I mean, in the in the original sense, without any constraints, it could also take three k. But we have said that it's not divisible by three here. So as you rightly pointed out, uh, you can have let's say three uh, p plus one and three p plus two. Okay. So n can only be of these two forms, uh, given the assumptions of our problem, right? Um, so let's just look at each of these cases. Um, try to see what n squared would be in each of these cases. See if that boils down to some sort of 3k plus 1. If it works for both cases, then we are done proving it, okay. So, this is case 1 and this is case 2, all right. So, case 1, n is equal to 3p plus 1. Okay, so how do we uh, look at this? So, n squared is equal to 9p squared plus 6p plus 1, which is 3 times 3p squared plus 2p plus 1, which is 3k plus 1, right? If my math is okay. Uh, so, what we are doing is just squaring 3p plus 1, we get 9p squared plus 6p plus 1. We group the terms that are divisible by 3 since we know, uh, you know, p is an integer, therefore, this is also an integer, therefore, this is divisible by 3. So, this is of some form 3k plus 1 where k is some other integer. Here, k is equal to 3p squared plus 2p. Um, similarly, if we have n equals 3p plus 2, uh, we do n squared equals 9p squared plus 12p, thank you plus 4, if my high school algebra is still not too rusty. Um, this gives us 3 times 3p squared plus 4p plus 1 plus 1, right? So, we are just grouping terms that are uh, divisible by 3 and this is again of the form 3k plus 1 for some k. Right. So, we have proved this for case 1 where we had uh, n equals 3p plus 1 and case 2 where n equals 3p plus 2. Do we have any other cases? None. So, we have proved that it is true for both cases and there are only two cases. Therefore, it is true overall. Thus, this statement is true. All right. Cool. Um, Let us go down to one last proof technique. Okay, so the last thing we will do is another powerful technique called proof by induction. Okay, so the uh, general idea of proof that uh, proof by induction is goes as follows: we first prove it for some sort of base case. So proof by induction induction is generally for some statements that are true, let's say for all all natural numbers or so on, uh, similar to the kind of statements we've been seeing here. Um, the general idea is that you first prove it for some base case, this is typically n equals 1 or n equals some small number typically where you can draw the base case out by hand. Uh, then you assume that it is true for n equals k and then try to prove it for n equals k plus 1, okay. So that is the general idea of proof by induction. Um, Let us see. Um, okay, let us do this one. So, prove that
okay so this is the uh, standard formula for some of the first 10 natural numbers uh, we want to prove that it is equal to n into n plus 1 by 2 okay, this can be done many ways but here let's just try to use proof by induction to do this okay um, so okay uh, what is the base case here so the base case is to prove for n equals 1 um, what's the left hand side just 1 what's the right hand side 1 into 2 by 2 which is equal to 1 therefore it's true for the base case okay so now we go to the uh, inductive step okay so assume it is true for n equals k okay so this means that we are saying 1 plus 2 plus 3 plus so on until k is equal to k into k plus 1 by 2 we assume that this is true now we want to try and prove it for n equals k plus 1 okay so for n equals k plus 1 our left hand side is equal to 1 plus 2 plus k plus k plus 1 okay which is equal to k into k plus 1 by 2 plus k plus 1 yes because we assume that 1 plus 2 plus all the way up to k was equal to k into k plus 1 by 2 that's that was our assumption in the inductive step this is equal to k into k plus 1 plus 2 times k plus 1 by 2 which is equal to k plus 1 into k plus 2 by 2 but this is what we wanted to prove right we started off wanting to prove that it was for uh, we had to prove the statement for n equals k plus 1 so for this the right hand side would have been k plus 1 into k plus 2 by 2 since we now substitute n equals k plus 1 in our original formula and this is what we have got from the left hand side so we proved that it was true for n equals 1 we assume that showing it true for n equals k we uh, uh, started looking at n equals k plus 1 using the assumption that we had that it was true for n equals k we also showed that it was true for n equals k plus 1 therefore we can conclude that this statement is true for any n uh, any natural number n okay so that's how uh, induction works um, there is also a variant of induction called strong induction uh, where you assume the base case you assume this that the statement is true for all values less than k and then show that it is true for k uh, in general the principle is the same so we are probably not going to go over it right now you can look at the notes if you feel like it um, so that brings us to the end of proof techniques uh, let us switch to probability um, any questions so far All right, we are doing decent on time. All right, um, so we will first go over some definitions and then go over some properties, some results, and so on. This is just uh, basics of probability okay so the first thing we will look at um, is something called omega um, which is called the sample space 
So, uh, omega typically represents the set of all possible outcomes of your experiment. So, for instance, if you were rolling a die, uh, what would omega be? Yes, so omega would just be 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, okay. Um, so, this is called the sample space, this would be omega in this case. So, we will um, just, just for clarity, we will start off dealing with examples from discrete probability and then uh, switch over to continuous probability in a while, all right. Um, so, this is uh, what the sample space means, um, event. So, any event, um, an event is any subset of omega, all right. So, let me give you some events and you tell me what it looks like. Um, so, so, what would this be? Very good, 1, 3 and 5. So, you could have events that, uh, for instance, let us see. So, what would the corresponding subset for this be? Would be an empty set. So, you could have events that are um, any subset of omega. Um, so, it could be empty, it could be omega itself. For instance, if you had uh, rolling any number, uh, it could be omega itself, or rolling a number between 1 and 6, for instance, both inclusive, it would just be omega itself. All right. Okay. So, um, let us see. All right. Um, so, the next thing we will do is what is a probability function. So, P is a map between events to 0, 1. Um, so, you take any event and map it to a point between 0 and 1 that represents the probability of that event occurring. Um, so, it should have some properties, uh, we will just go over the properties now. What would P of omega be? 1, all right. Um, and then we will go to the concept of unions and intersections, okay. Um, So, um, if you look at the union of two events, it is basically the union of the two sets that represent the events. Uh, if you wanted to look at it diagrammatically, if you had two events uh, A and B, uh, so A union B would be, this would be A union B and let us see. would be A intersection B. So, this would be, okay. So, if that is that is the extent of my drawing skills, but as long as it represents what is A union B and A intersection B, now that is cool. Um, so, for disjoint events, some more terminology. So, disjoint events are events such that A intersection B is a null set. Um, so, if you had to represent them diagrammatically, this would be your two disjoint events. Um, so, for any uh, disjoint events, uh, you can say 
what can you say about the probability of A union B for any two disjoint events? No, what, what, that is that's the probability of A intersection B. What could you say about the pro probability of A union B for? Yes. So, uh, union represents or normally. So, a good way to think about it is that intersection represents and and union represents or. So, if you have probability of A intersection B, uh, the way you think about it in human language is, what is the probability that A and B are both happening? Uh, A union B, uh, what is the probability that A or B happen? So, in this case, either A or B could happen, this would just be P of A plus P of B, all right. Um, in general, so this is this is specifically if A and B are disjoint. All right. So, in general, probability of A union B can be expressed as probability of A plus probability of B minus probability of A intersection B. All right. So, um, a simple proof by diagram for this. Um, so, if you had A and if you had B, um, what is the probability of A union B? It is the probability of this whole thing, right? This, this entire, sorry, let me resort to. So, this is A union B, all right. Uh, but what are we saying? We are saying that it is equal to probability of A, which is all this plus probability of B, which is all this. So, we are double counting this area, right. So, this needs to be subtracted out and this is A intersection B. So, probability of A, uh, so probability of A union B is probability of A plus probability of B minus whatever you double counted, which is A intersection B, all right. So, this is, this is in general true uh, and when you have disjoint events, you know that A intersection B is a null set, which means probability of A intersection B is 0, uh, which means this term goes away to leave you with probability of A union B is probability of A plus probability of B, all right. Okay. Um, the next thing we will look at is something called the union bound. So, the union bound is in general um, a useful result to know to get like an upper bound on the probability of unions of events. So, what the union bound states is that if you have n events a 1, a 2, all the way until a n, the probability of all right. So, what you are saying here is that the probability of the union of all these events um, is less than or equal to the sum of the probabilities of the individual events. Um, in English, this means that the probability of a 1 or A 2 or A 3 or all the way up to A n happening uh, is less than the probability of A 1 happening plus the probability of A 2 happening plus the probability of A 3 happening. So, this is this is called the union bound. Uh, this is again uh, useful, let us let us just go, uh, look at an example and see how you would use the union bound. Um, so, let us say you had um, a 1 in 100,000 chance of uh, a car accident on a given day. So, you get up in the morning, you decide to get onto your bike or car or whatever you do and you have a 1 in 100,000 chance of getting into an accident, all right. Um, so, if you go, uh, if, if you say that a year has 365 days, uh, using the union bound, you can say that the probability of getting into an accident
uh, in one year is definitely less than 365 by 100,000, right? Because what we are doing here is we are taking the each A1 is the first day of the year and all the way until A365, which is the last day of the year. Um, and we are using the right hand side. Um, so on each day, it's just 1 by 100,000, whatever we make up the numbers. Um, and uh, we have 365 such days, therefore, that sums to 365 over 100,000. Um, probability of getting into an accident in one year, therefore, is uh, using the union bound is upper bounded by 365 over 100,000. All right, cool. Um, so now let's move on. Okay, so let's now go to the definition of conditional probability. All right, um, so I'm again going to do this by using an example. So let's say you are taking some sort of standardized test, let's say the GRE, um, and you see that 2.5 percent of students get a perfect score, perfect math score, let us say, all right. Um, and then this, this is one number that you have, you look a little deeper and you say that 7.5 um, percent of uh, physical science majors get a perfect math score and 6.3% um, of engineering majors get a perfect math score, all right. So um, what conditional probability means, we are not, not going to solve anything here, just using this as an example to illustrate what it means. Um, so the probability of getting a perfect math score. Uh, on itself, if you did not know anything about a student, uh, the probability of getting a perfect math score here would be 2.5 uh, percent, whereas the probability of perfect math score given, uh, let us say, engineering major would be 6.3 percent, okay. So, this is typically how conditional probability is represented. Um, so, where you draw this sort of vertical pipe kind of, vertical bar kind of symbol, uh, this is represented as A given B, okay. So, probability of a perfect math score given an engineering major is 6.3 percent, okay. Um, so, how we would um, calculate this using the formula is generally P of A given B is P of A intersection B by P of B. So in other words, if you had to compute this number, what would you do? You would first go and see which people were getting a perfect score in math and were engineering majors, that would be your numerator your denominator would just be all the engineering majors themselves. Um, so you are saying that given the population of engineering majors, what fraction of them got a perfect score in math? That is your probability that you would compute here, okay, cool. So that is uh, conditional probability. Let us also do So two events A and B 
are said to be independent if p of a given b is equal to p of a. So, the occurrence of the uh, conditioning on the second element does not change the probability of the first, uh, um, first event occurring. Um, that is called independence of two events A and B. Um, what you can also say from here is Okay, can can you tell me what P of A intersection B would be if A and B were independent? P A times P B. P A times P B. Uh, we get that by using this. We say P of A intersection B normally would be P of A given B times P B, but we know that A and B are independent, which means P of A given B is P of A. Therefore, this boils down to P of A times P of B. Okay, cool. So. Um, Let us go to the next related topic now. So, we go to what is called Bayes theorem or Bayes rule, all right. So, we have, um, so we, we generally go step by step for Bayes theorem. Um, so, let us say we had uh, events, we start off with conditional probability. All right, uh, but we also know that we can write P of A intersection B as so we are just using uh, the definition of conditional probability again uh, on the numerator um, to express it as P of B given A times P of A uh, divided by P of B. All right, so. From here, we can say that this is equal to P of B given A times P of A by, so P of B can be expressed as P of Okay, so this denominator can also be expressed as uh, P of B intersection A plus P of B intersection A bar, uh, A bar or A dash or A complement, whatever you call it, just means not A, all right. Uh, and this could again be expressed as the numerator stays the same, P of B given A times P of A divided by P of B given A times P of A plus P of B given A bar times P of A bar, all right. So, this uh, is what Bayes theorem is. Um, it is useful for um, problems where you have, uh, you are given some, some uh, statistics about a total population and what happens under certain circumstances and then you see a particular outcome and then you want to see whether it was, uh, how true that is reflective of your original condition being present or not, all right. That is where you typically apply things like Bayes theorem. Um, Let us go over another example, all right. So, uh, let us assume that um, 1 percent of women have breast cancer. Okay. And there is a particular diagnostic test. Um, so, if uh, if a woman has breast cancer, 
the test shows positive 90% of the time. If a woman does not have breast cancer, a test shows positive 10% of the time. Okay, so this is, this is the setup for the problem. So we are running some sort of diagnostic uh, facility where uh, we have a particular test to screen for breast cancer. Uh, if breast cancer is actually present in the patient, uh, it shows positive 90% of the time, uh, but there are also these 10% false positives, right? Um, so now somebody comes and reports uh, a true test. So, you know, we can call it reports a positive test. So, what is the actual probability that uh, this person has cancer, okay? So, that is what we use Bayes' theorem for. Uh, this just boils down to the same kind of formulation. So, we have P of cancer given positive is P of positive given cancer times P of cancer divided by P of positive. So, we are just replacing everything into this formulation here, where B is positive, positive being positive test result, A is actually having cancer, uh, and we are going to expand it out like what we did. So, this is, um, let us see, 0 0.9 times 0 0.01. So, 0 0.9 comes from the 90% positive probability here, 0 0.01 comes from the fact that 1% of women actually have breast cancer divided by 0 0.9 times 0 0.01 plus 0 0.1 times uh, the rest which is 0 0.99, okay. So, this basically says, uh, this is the same as the term in the numerator. This says that 99% um, of the population does not have breast cancer, but even for that population, our test would show positive 10% uh, of the time, which is 0 0.1, and this boils down to something like 8.3%. Uh, so, this is um, a fairly low number you would not want to trust this test if it said that uh, a person tested positive for breast cancer, okay? So, this is how you use Bayes' rule, all right? What are we doing on time? Okay. Right now, we talk about something called random variables. So, uh, you can define a random variable as a function x going from omega to generally the whole uh, real line um, that deals a different value uh, for any uh, point in the sample space that you choose. Um, so, for instance, let us say um, we were tossing three coins and let x denote the number of heads, all right? 
uh, then probability of x equals 0 would be what would it be uh, 3 I should have said 3 fair coins yes then it would be 1 half to the power 3 which is 1 eighth okay so that is what a random variable is in many uh, instances it is useful to express things as a random variable to do further computations about them which we will come down to now um, okay let us uh, come down to probability mass functions probability density functions and cumulative density functions so let's just do pds and cds so um, the probability uh, mass function in general is something where you can look at a particular interval and see what is if, if you are looking at discrete probability you can look at a particular event which is a collection of points in the sample space and see uh, what the probability associated with that is. Um, in the case of continuous probability it is not as easy to do that because um, the probability estimate associated with a single point in space is always 0. Um, so what you can do instead is try to find out what the probability is of something occurring between a point A and a point B okay if that was unclear um, so this is generally denoted by f the probability density function um, so what this means is that the probability that a is less than or equal to x is less than or equal to b is integral from a to b f of x dx okay so the probability that our given x lies between uh, a and b uh, is given by this integral and this f is known as the probability density function okay so um, f has some properties um, so first f of x must always be greater than or equal to 0 for any x um, integral from minus infinity to plus infinity of f of x dx would be what would it be 1 and um, and for any uh, set a uh, integral over a of f of x dx would be the probability that x belongs to a all right uh, so this is the probability density function um, a very related concept is that of cumulative density functions generally represented by capital F of x. Um, which is the probability that x is less than or equal to a given uh, point x. So f of x is given by integral from minus infinity to x f of t dt. Um, the properties of capital F uh, lies between so where would capital F lie between 0 and 1 uh, as x tends to minus infinity capital F would go to 0 as x tends to plus infinity it would go to 1 uh, f of x must be non decreasing and right continuous. So the right continuous comes from the definition of uh, how we do uh, the, the way we define f where we define the uh, it is the probability that it is less than or equal to a given point x um, so f must be non decreasing and right continuous all right uh, cool we have about 15 minutes to go oh we have about 25 minutes to go so that's enough time um, let's go over to Okay. So 
the expectation or the expected value or the mean of a given random variable uh, can be thought of as some sort of weighted average. Um, so in discrete space we have uh, for a given random variable x we would say e of x is equal to summation x p of x equals x and in continuous space we have e of x is integral minus infinity to plus infinity x times f of x dx. Okay. So, we are, uh, so this is some sort of weighted average and this is an analog of weighted average in continuous space. Uh, we will go over some properties of expectations. Uh, Okay, so, the first property which is fairly important is known as linearity of expectation. Uh, so, e of x plus y is e of x plus e of y, this is true uh, irrespective of what x and y are. Um, so, even if x and y are not independent for instance, this is always true. Um, the other thing to note is e of alpha times x, where alpha is some constant is alpha times e of x. So, this is, this, this is called linearity of expectation. Uh, okay, the next thing we are going to talk about is something called variance. Uh, so, the variance which is typically denoted as uh, sigma squared of x um, is given by expectation of x minus e of x the whole squared. Uh, another way to think of it is expectation of x squared minus expectation of x the whole squared. So, the expectation of x here is a mean that we spoke about earlier. Um, so, this variance is some sort of measure of how far away uh, things are from the mean. Um, we should So, if we have uh, similarly, if we want to look at properties, uh, so if we had variance of uh, A x alpha x would be uh, alpha squared times variance of x. So, no longer in squared space, uh, no longer in linear space, um, variance of x plus beta, where beta is a constant would be variance of x um, I guess that is. So, when we have variance of x plus y um, we cannot say anything as is about it. So, variance of x plus y is equal to variance of x plus variance of y is not always true. So, this is true only when x and y are uncorrelated. Um, there is some other material uh, we probably would not cover it now for want of time on what correlation and uh, uh, means. Um, in general, um, any any if, if x and y are independent they are always uncorrelated, but the converse is not true. Um, so, the variance of x plus y is equal to variance of x plus variance of y only when x and y are uncorrelated. All right, uh, cool. Let us okay.
All right. Um, so now we will look at some kinds of uh, special random variables. All right. So the first thing we will look at is called a Bernoulli random variable. So this is basically analogous to a coin flip. Um, so if you have a Bernoulli random variable x, uh, it takes a value uh, 1 with probability p, 0 with probability 1 minus p. Um, Let us do some calculation. So what would the expectation of this be? Um, if we just wanted to go over it by hand, it would be 1 times p plus 0 times 1 minus p, that is p. Similarly, the variance of x would be the expectation of x squared minus e of x, the whole squared. So, we are using the second definition for variance that we saw. Um, so, expectation of x squared would be p squared in a similar manner to this. Uh, and uh, sorry, expectation of x squared would be p and expectation of x the whole squared would be p squared. That is right because expectation of x squared would be 1 squared times p plus 0 squared times 1 minus p. Uh, so, this is p minus p squared which is uh, p into 1 minus p. Yes. Okay. So, that it is Bernoulli random variables. Um, the next one is geometric random variables. Okay. Um, so, geometric random variables is uh, let us say you keep flipping a coin um, until you get heads. Um, this represents how many times you have to flip the coin before you get the first head. Okay. So, probability of x equals k here this means that you get the first head on the kth coin flip, uh, where p is the probability of heads. This would be given by p times 1 minus p to the k minus 1. Um, so, how you would think about this is that if you got your first head on the kth flip, that means the first k minus 1 flips were all tails and the kth flip was a head. The so, uh, tail probability is 1 minus p, so the first k minus 1 were all tails, 1 minus p to the k minus 1 times uh, a head on the on the kth flip that is a p. So, this is uh, the probability um, again for this we are not going to go over this, but e of x is 1 over p variance of x is 1 minus p by p squared. Okay. Um, Right, so those um, Bernoulli and geometric random variables were discrete. So now we will look at some continuous random variables. So first one we will look at is uniform random variable, which generally looks like this. So this is. this is f of x, uh, this is the probability density function of a uniform random variable. So, between um, a and b it is uh, uniformly distributed, so it can take any value between a and b uniformly and anywhere else it is 0. Um, so, this is basically given this way f of x is equal to 1 over b minus a if a less than equal to x less than equal to b, 0 otherwise, right. Um, so, uh, can anyone tell me why we have this 1 over b minus a? It has to, area has to accept 1. Yeah. So, uh, we know that integral f of x dx should be 1 always, uh, and we know that this exists only between a and b. This length is b minus a, so this has to be 1 over b minus a, all right. Uh, that is correct. 
Um, again, for this, we have e of x is equal to a plus b by 2, variance of x is b minus a the whole squared by 12. Um, so, th these are things you typically will not need to know uh, and if you do need to know, we will give it to you. Nobody expects you to know the variance of a uniform random variable uh, off the top of your head. Um, and the last one we will look at today is of course, what is known as the uh, normal random variable, also known as the Gaussian random variable. Okay. Um, so, the probability density function, so this, this shows up basically anywhere. Um, the Gaussian random variable shows up anywhere and everywhere. Um, I will just give you the formula, f of x is given by uh, 1 by root 2 pi sigma squared e to the minus of x minus mu the whole squared by 2 sigma squared. Okay, this might just seem to be a lot of uh, garbage if you have not seen this before. Uh, this is generally parameterized by two quantities, one is mu which is the mean of the distribution and other is sigma which is the standard deviation, the standard deviation is just the square root of the variance. Uh, what the pro, what this distribution looks like is this. Uh, you have some sort of, pardon my poor drawing, this is supposed to be like a symmetric bell curve um, centered at mu and um, sigma in some way represents how, um, how spread out it is. So, a larger value of sigma would mean that the curve is more flat and spread out, a uh, smaller value of sigma would mean that it is uh, sharp and pointed, all right. Um, so, here again e of x is mu, variance of x is sigma squared, all right, um, okay. So, given that we have only about 10-ish minutes to go, um, I think I will skip to the last part of today. Um, Okay, so, as a final thought, we are going to deal with two things called Markov's inequality and once we do this, we will extend this to another inequality called Chebyshev's inequality. Um, so, this gives you um, some relationship between probabilities of events happening and their expectation. Um, so, Markov's inequality states the following, uh, so for uh, any random variable x that takes non-negative. Okay, um, so the proof is proof takes a bit of time, but we should be able to go over it if I remember how to prove it. Uh, let's see. think this should work. So, this should be the 
other way. Okay, yes, I think I have successfully proved it. Um, so let me just go over what the proof looks like. Um, so we'll start with the definition for expectation. Uh, so we say e of x is integral from minus infinity to plus infinity x times f of x dx. So this is just the definition of the expectation. Um, what we do in the next step is split up the integral. So we say integral from uh, minus infinity to uh, a x times f of x dx plus integral from a to infinity x times f of x dx. So we are not doing anything special here, just splitting at a. Uh, now we know that x is, uh, we know that x is non-negative, it takes only non-negative values and we always know that f of x is going to be greater than or equal to 0 for all x. Um, so this is, this is def, so this is definitely a positive number, right? So this plus this is definitely greater than or equal to just this, which is integral a to infinity x f of x dx, okay? Um, and since we are going from a to infinity and doing x f of x dx, that is always greater than or equal to integral a to infinity a times f of x dx. Because for any point between a and infinity, uh, any point x between a and infinity, x is always greater than a, right? Um, so we, so, and this is greater than or equal to, we can pull a out since it's a constant, a times this this basically remains as integral a to infinity f of x dx, which is just the probability that x is greater than or equal to a, right? Um, you just move this uh, a down here. So we have that e of x is greater than or equal to a times probability that x is greater than or equal to a. Move the a down, you get probability of x greater than or equal to a is less than or equal to uh, expectation of x over a, okay? So this is called Markov's inequality. Um, and the last thing I think I will leave you guys with is is something called Chebyshev's inequality. Okay, so we, uh, Chebyshev's inequality states that um, the probability that the absolute difference between a given uh, random variable x and its expectation is greater than or equal to a is less than or equal to the variance of x by a squared. Um, so how we get Chebyshev's inequality uh, is by applying Markov's inequality to the random variable x minus e of x, the whole squared. Um, so this gives you probability of x minus e of x, the whole squared greater than or equal to, uh, so and, and we take the constant as a squared this time, uh, greater than or equal to a squared is less than or equal to uh, e of x minus e of x, the whole squared by a squared. Uh, but we know that from the first definition of variance, e of x minus e of x, the whole squared uh, is nothing but variance of x. So this just becomes variance of x, which means the probability of, and this is equivalent to this, um, say, saying this and saying this are the same, the two LHS are, the, are equivalent. The RHS, this is just the variance, so this just becomes variance of x, and therefore we get a probability of uh, absolute value of x minus e of x is greater than or equal to a is less than or equal to uh, variance of x over a squared. And this is called Chebyshev's inequality, okay? Um, so there are a few things that we have skipped. I think we covered most of what we wanted to cover. Um, so that should be um, good for you guys. If you have any questions, uh, we will be putting up these notes on the course website, this video will also be up on the site 
and if you have any other questions you always have Piazza to contact us. Um, we have another uh, review session for linear algebra, so if you guys have some questions on linear algebra or would you uh, would like to know more, um, it is on Thursday. Um, I think the venue will also be gets B01, but we will clarify in any case on Piazza, so just keep an eye out for that post. All right. Um, so that is it for today. Uh, 